Welcome to Pro Baseball World Tour here on RGC Multimedia. Rick Crab on the line with our, this time of year, Florida correspondent, Mr. Eric Marenbeck. Eric, how is your week in baseball and week in general? I am so happy that Sunday couldn't come any faster and let the game begin, damn it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Especially with spring training starting up for all the major league teams and all the our favorite Asian leagues as well, so definitely looking forward to that. Um, and, it, and it's interesting you bring up the Asian leagues. I'm actually watching now a uh, recording of last night's uh, game from Japan, uh, Sabu against Southbank. Apparently what a lot of these teams are doing preseason is they're only playing seven in a game. Hmm. And they're also having no fans, you know, just to be on the safe side. That's I fine. Can, I can definitely understand. I mean, granted, Asia is much safer than we are still, even with the vaccine, you know, underway. But, hey, better safe than sorry. And you know what? If you don't have any fans for a couple of weeks, no biggie. Because once the season rolls around, everybody's going to want to go come in here and, you know, just do what we do. Sure. In Asia, whether it's Taiwan, Japan, or Korea, it's a hell of a lot safer than it is here so far. Right. And COVID aside, Eric, I mean, it's definitely smart as far as player safety is concerned. I mean, it seems like, I mean, MPB, they don't pay as much as Major League Baseball, but they're... They still pay a lot of high salary players. You, I'm sure they don't want to endanger their investments, number one. Number two, probably playing the seven inning games is probably a smart thing to do also for player safety wise. I mean, it's kind of like, I guess, like professional football where you have like your starters play maybe like, you know, one or two series or something like that. And then you let your backups play the rest of the game. And, and get their ears wet. Exactly. But, um, and the, the you know the feeling of being back on the field again, which oh. is what which is what the first couple of weeks of spring training, you know, over here are for anyway. I mean, you'll get your nine inning games, which, by the way, some of the games of the first couple of weeks they claim, depending on pitching staff and depending on who wants to do what, for the first. I think they said week or so. You can play either five inning games or seven inning games. Hmm. I read something about that. And where did you say that was? Was that you said that was Japan? Where's that Taiwan? Or where was that again? No, that's no, that's here. Oh, that's here. Okay. That's here for like the first week or so. Hmm. Um, as far as the spring training that I've been watching, you know, overseas. They had the Dragons game on uh, from yesterday, and that went, that went only seven. This Japan game, I don't know what's going on, but I, it may be only a seven inning. But they're saying for MLB, uh, they can cut it off at five hmm. or seven. Right. So it's, it's, it's just cool to be back on the field and to have a certain amount of fans in the stand. Yeah, that's... It's kind of, it is kind of funny, though, that some of the teams still haven't put tickets on sale. In Florida, anyway. I mean, there's right. a good... Off the top of my head, I will say Red Sox, Rays, and Pirates, and Braves, for that matter, have not even put tickets online hmm. yet. Now, now Eric... That's a, that's a, the good thing about the brains is I got somebody in the front office there who, I don't know, we, we kind of get along uh, sarcasm-wise. 
Mm-hmm. So even though tickets are supposed to actually go on sale tomorrow, she called me yesterday and said, let's get the drone. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. I love the British. All right, that, that's pretty cool. But I'm wondering, Aaron, if, it, if that has to do with local jurisdictions. Now, I mean, we know Florida is lax, more lax than a lot of states in the country. But Florida is a big state. And I'm wondering if they just like certain counties or jurisdictions or whatever have different COVID protocols. Maybe some will allow 25 percent, or some allow 10 percent, some allow 50 percent, some don't allow any. I mean, how, how could that be what's why some of these teams are hesitant right now with the tickets? Or? Um, as a matter of fact, you know, Florida and their corrupt government that they've got over here, mm-hmm. they're bragging up the, up the wazoo about how their state is open, their state is open, it's a wonderful state, blah, blah, blah. We're taking care of our seniors, yada, yada, yada. And yet some of the teams have not put up uh, charitable protocol yet as far as uh, actual ticket sales, as I said. Not only that, but a lot of these teams are only selling in pods of four. Mm. Which, you know, unless you've got people down here that you go with on a normal basis, uh, you're not paying for four tickets. Hell no. I'm I myself, okay, and in fact, this is a true story because it actually happened to me today. I got screwed out of uh, Marlins and Cardinals tickets, which went, and I'm going to use air quotes, uh, similar to Austin Powers with the Dr. Evil expression. One million million million. <laughs> tickets on sale today were leftovers from the quote-unquote season ticket holders. Not for nothing, but there are no season ticket holders in the Jupiter area other than maybe a handful of Marlin season ticket holders down in Miami. Because the majority of the people that show up for these games are people that come down from St. Louis. These are not season ticket holders. There's a lot of broker crap that goes on and or scalpers. So they were only putting up pods of four today. And not only that, but when I did eventually get through and I got someone to actually help me because I figured, okay, from what the remainder of my schedule is or can be built up to be, I was figuring on going on 11 games in Jupiter, whether it was Cardinals or Marlins. Not only were they either selling in Cubs before, but as the reluctant guy got on the phone, and I don't know whether he did this deliberately or what, he shut me out of all 11 games. Mm. So... The remainder of my schedule, uh, even though it's a pain in the butt for me, on the weekends, I will go to West Palm to either do the National or the Nass Road. But most of my during the week stuff will be on the West Coast, and then I'll stay over for a few days just to conserve gas for a few days, like either in the Fort Myers area for the Twins, which I've already gotten tickets for, which is good. I've gotten a couple of Yankee tickets in Tampa. I've gotten a couple of uh, Tiger tickets in Lakeland. Braves tickets in Venice. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Pirates are actually going up tomorrow, so I'll try to get my hands on a couple of games. Red Sox and Rays still haven't put up theirs yet, which kind of boggles the mind. But Phillies and Orioles were also doing the four bit, and I ain't doing four. No, <laughs> oh. I'm not satisfied in four seats, and I don't have uh, you know friends in that neck of the woods that I can sell those tickets to, or even treat them again. 
Well, if... If I weren't, like, I don't know... How far of a drive is it down for you, Eric? Like, 16-hour drive or whatever? I don't know. I would go down there, maybe. Well, from New York? Yeah. Well, from New York, I can, I can do, like, where I am now. Mm -hmm. In a total driving time of about 20 hours. 20 hours. Okay. Yeah, that's... I was going to say, it's pretty sizable. And I would probably be... Be, I would probably only beat you by maybe three of those hours. So yeah, uh, no, no thanks. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, just three, three and a half uh, over to you. I remember from when we met up uh, this past year when you gave me the stuff. Mm -hmm. But do that as it may, I'm gonna have to do a lot of driving, which is what I normally do anyway. And as far as you know. All the extracurricular stuff, uh, autographs or whatever, which is probably going to be slim to none. I'm just going to fill up my trunk. <laughs> Let the chips fall where they may. There you go. Actually, I don't even have a trunk. I have a hatchback. Hmm. Okay, well, that might work out better for you. But... You never know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even in a hatchback, I mean, you can probably... Probably stash a few bobbleheads there, you know. Probably might have to sta stomp at Staples or Home Depot, get some bubble wrap or something, but, you know, it'll be all right. <laughs> oh, I've got these fuckers boxed up. It's just a question of, and I've heard rumors anyway, that you won't even be able to carry bags in, you know, bags full of stuff because of protocol. I don't know. Hmm. Probably, and everything, you know what? Everything is probably going to be a surprise once we get to wherever destination is whatever. Mm -hmm. It probably will be and it seems like that's what always happens whenever there's something tragic or say you know or safety wise or whatever it's like it seemed like after 9-11 surprisingly may Baseball, or at least the Orioles, they were good about that. They let you bring in food. For, the only thing they wouldn't let you bring in or anything in bottles, but glass bottles. But they let you know they had a lot of vendors sell hot dogs and cans of sodas. I'm sure you're aware. You've gone to some games there, but everywhere else is like the National Football League. All of a sudden, it's like, oh no, no sir, you, you, you know, we you can't bring in any bags. Even though I went in one time with a like a little clear Ziploc bag of chicken wings from a vendor, and they're Guards like, no, sorry, you can't bring that in. And it's like, so it's kind of like, yeah, they say they're doing it for safety, but it's really their cheap asses don't want you to bring in other food, you know. And they want you to right. spend, you know, $20 on a plate of fish and chips. So it's like, oh, whatever. That's, that's why, you know, even during the normal season, in minor league baseball, you can't bring in anything. No. Because they're basically... Uh, Looking for revenue from concessions or anything that they can get their early little hands on, so that doesn't surprise me. No. The, the miners, I can understand, though, because they, they kind of remind me of, like, the, I don't know, the old dollar movie theaters or stuff like that, where it's like, they're not going to make money off, their their tickets are much cheaper, and they're not going to, you know, they, they need they need the concession money, I think, more than the major leagues do, you know, the major leagues, because... I remember reading a long time ago, and I used to have, when I was a kid, I used to have a subscription to Sports Illustrated, and he did a story about concessions in stadiums, and they actually did like a pie chart of, it was basically, it was like a cup of beer from a Cincinnati Reds game, and they divided it up as far as, the they gave like the price of the beer, and then what percentage, who got cut of what, and it was like, it was like the beer vendor got a little bit, the Cincinnati Reds got a little bit. The city of Cincinnati got a little bit. The state of Ohio got a little bit of it. The state got some more of it from a, an amusement tax. Uh, and it, it, it was split like seven or eight ways, Eric. And, I mean, the reason it was, you know, it's like if you buy a bottle of beer or a cup of soda, and, and it's, you know, it's more than what you pay for, like, for a six-pack or a case of each of those in a store. That's why. It's not just... The team's making off with that. It's not just the Anheuser Busch or Mill or Coors making off with that. It's the city of Baltimore, the state of Maryland, the city of New York, the borough of the Bronx, whatever. I mean, it's government sticking their greedy hands in it too. So you know that's everybody's got their hands in the 
Jack. Oh, yeah. And this business, though, of, you know, charging for pods, that's, uh, uh, you know, Orioles, boo! Shame on you! I'm... Once again, I am in my studio in Baltimore, Maryland. I have statues of the 70 Orioles to my right. Boo! Shame on you! you well, the part that I can understand in some ways because of the social distancing bit, but make it sort of semi-reasonable to as if I have to put fours. Unless I've got a group that I'm going with that's willing to, you know, like, gobble up my other three. So this way, you know, my losses are offset a little bit. Fine. I'll, I'll take two. Mm-hmm. But I won't take four. Especially right. down here. But I don't know anybody except for a bunch of senior citizens that, uh... Mm-hmm. Don't do anything anyway, but play bingo and the occasional uh, golf or tennis. I mean, I told you, told you off the air and on one of these episodes, Eric. I mean, spring training is on one of my sports bucket lists. I mean, I I would probably pay a you know a double price ticket. Like if I mean, I don't know what were, what were they saying like prices were per ticket. I mean, if it was like you know they were like twenty dollars tickets and you know you had to put my group of four. You know, I, I'd probably pay forty dollars to go to like one game or something. But I don't know. I would do too many of those, but I don't know. What were they talking about down there? Well, I got a break with the Braves uh, where she was only charging me uh, $15, $15 a ticket for the two seats. Uh, so it wound up 30, 30 per game. The seats were out in center field. I don't really care at this point because, again, if I knew I was getting the stuff autographed, I probably would have, you know, paid for better seats. But in this COVID era, where you don't know what the heck's going on or how their interaction between fans and players are, just get me into the game. Right. I'm going to stop in. If it doesn't get time, boo hoo. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, I've been, I've always been in that opinion anyway. It's like, as long as I'm not sitting in front of a foul pole, I, I don't mind sitting in the cheap seats. I, you know, if I'm, I'll have fun. I can see the ball game anyway. Sometimes, sometimes even from the cheap seats, you see things that you wouldn't see on TV. So, I mean, but I don't know. It's, I, I, I've just always been that way. It's, but that's just me. I know I've gone, I've gone with some people. It's like my, my, I have a couple of friends that I go with. Minor league games. It's like when he and I used to just be. It would just be me and him going. We'd be the same way. We'd sit in the upper deck. We'd sit in box seats. We wouldn't care. When he got married and his wife, you know, went to games with us. God forbid she should have to sit in metal bleachers. He has to sit in like box seats that are only four rows away from you know the from from the general admission and you know it's being like a minor league ballpark that would have like maybe be like 20 rows deep total you know what i mean so it, it, i don't know i i was kind of like i just out of principle i didn't want to pay you know 20 dollars for you know when i could only sit five backs for five seats further and pay like 12 you know and it's like i don't know what are you gonna do well, I mean, <laughs> you know even even in minor leagues okay under, and, and we're talking normal circumstances, you buy the cheap seats and you move to wherever. I was trying to, you know, just get away with whatever I could just to be in the ballpark. Right. Um, so in, in this type of scenario, with the Braves, you know, they had to bring out the center field. Otherwise, for like the Yankee tickets, I'm paying 25 each. Uh, Twins tickets, I'm paying, I think, 30 each. Same with the uh, Astros and Nationals over at uh, West Palm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tigers, I think it was either 30 or 35 for, for both Yankee games. Uh, I want to see what they're doing with Pittsburgh uh, tomorrow. But, you know, I, I won't go too crazy. 
I just want to be in the ballpark. Right, right. And, you know, if I can get anything autographed by players that just happen to be there at the time, because don't forget, you don't know who's going to show up at any given time. True. Uh, your starting lineup will have your quote-unquote starters in there, but the starters are only in there for like three, four innings. Mm. And then, you you know, my leaguers trying to make an impression or anybody else who's on a 40-man roster, so. Yeah. I remember watching and listening to the spring training games and, like, the announcers would be complaining about, you know, some of the minor mm-hmm. leaguers, they wouldn't have their name, they wouldn't have their numbers or their names, like, I guess, in their roster sheets, and they'd be, like, frustrated, you know, they'd have, they'd be like, well, I guess this will have to be how I start off in college, balls hit the second, throw in the first, you know, uh, you know they, they wouldn't know the players' names, uh, I mean, I've done college games, and I can understand what they're talking about, but it's like, um, you know what, I did them for free at, like, a Division two or three college, you're getting paid a lot more than me, so, you know, get some people to get on it, <laughs> it's like, Just, you know, roll with the punches at this point. Yeah. Let the games get in their way. My last high school game will be Saturday with, uh, you know, Mayor Ramirez's kid and just hanging out over there. I may go to uh, my friend's uh, junior college game tomorrow all the way up in Melbourne, hmm. which is two hours up and back. Okay. To hang out a little while. Um, and, you know, Sunday we get rolling. Yeah, yeah. And hope springs eternal, even for my team, until reality kicks in, you know. But, you know, <laughs> it's... Uh, yeah, they, they had a funny skit on sports radio about it yesterday where they were talking about... I forget who it was. I think it was ESPN or one of the publications they were giving percentages of every team in the majors to make the playoffs. The Orioles were literally the worst at 0.0% chance of making the playoffs. And they actually got a clip of the Dean from Animal House on the radio when they did that. And, you know, the play-by-play host would say 0.0 and then they'd have the Animal House clip 0.0. And they just kept doing that throughout the whole day. It's funny. But, hmm. Yeah. But that is one thing that's going to be interesting, though, Eric, as far as we're going to have, hopefully we'll have longer seasons than we did last year for all of the leagues. And to see how how these teams pan out, whether teams that weren't, spo- weren't expected to make it, like the Marlins, that did well, will they do well this coming season? A lot of people don't expect them to, but I don't know, we'll see. I, I don't know, because, I mean, really, I mean, the... See, this past season was probably the length of a normal non-COVID season, like a third of the length of a non-COVID season. So, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm curious to see how that will look. I mean, my team is kind of like basically, all right, look, maybe three or four years, maybe we can talk about maybe some type of postseason contention right now, rebuild, you know, but we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's rebuild city for a lot, a lot of teams. I mean, even the Yankees, okay? They're on paper, you know, first or second place in the division. If you, if you look deep down, though, in the numbers, starting rotation is basically Garrett Cole and a box of band-aids. Right. And that's coming from one of the bigger Yankee fans. You know, mm-hmm. in the country. Well, I think um, with the Yankees, too, it's more the uh, the other players in the lineup, too. I think it's more they're counting on, I guess, offense and fielding, you know, the, basically the, the rest of the lineup as far as for you guys. But one thing, though, gonna, yeah. You're going you're gonna to have to bludgeon teams more than uh, pitching and defense at this point. Problem is, I think they're in for... I don't know. I think, yeah, at least, I think it'll be, I, I think it'll be a three-team division this year, Eric. I think I think Toronto and Tampa, I think, still might be tough this year. So, I, yeah, I think they might make things interesting. I mean, Tan, I mean, Toronto especially is trying to 
splash all over the place. The only team I think in majors that aren't splashing more would be they aren't splashing more than would be maybe the Padres. But I mean, I don't know. Toronto looks like they're trying to bolster their stuff, and it, which is amazing since they don't know where the heck they're going to play their games. But they're counting on playing them somewhere and playing them well. So I don't know. Well, they're, they're saying that, uh, what we covered last week that the first. Uh couple of home fans or so will be their spring home in Dunedin. Right. Instead of uh, being in uh, Buffalo or Canada or whatever. Right. So that could be interesting. And quite frankly, that would be the only thing keeping me down in Florida because, and, and this is what's bugging me about the latest in protocol for major leagues. New York announced uh, a week or so ago that any venue is allowed 10% of capacity. Now, Yankee Stadium-wise, where I have my season tickets, that's 48, uh, I believe capacity is close to, between 48 and 50, which means close to 5,000 fans will be allowed in. Mm-hmm. Between you me and the wall, there's got to be more than five thousand season uh, full season ticket holders, and or even plan holders. So, how do you justify based on tenure who gets what? And unfortunately, these teams are getting little or no information to the fans. Right. Um, especially my brain dead ticket rep in New York, who I will take every opportunity to knock because she's really not a ticket rep, but mm-hmm. <laughs> she pretends to uh, play one on, on TV, you know, kind of like, uh, I'm not a, I'm only a doctor on TV, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know. But she stayed at a Holiday Inn once, yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. She remembered you doing that, so I don't know. It, it could be a start. And you never know. I don't know. Maybe take her to candlelight dinner at the New York Yankee Steakhouse in the stadium. I heard it's really nice. I don't know. Maybe that might sweeten the deal for who knows. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes, I don't know, sometimes you make your own fun. Sometimes you have different kind of fun. Although, I, I you know, I do miss going to those games because, I mean, I don't know how you are with it, Eric. I mean, I, I enjoy watching them, don't get me wrong. But sometimes, I'm with my friends, we'll talk about everything but what's going on with the game. You know, it's, it's weird. I mean, and it's weird because usually what we talk about are other sports. Because it's like, my buddy and I, I mean, he, we were... He was or he was an Oriole fan for a long time, even though he lived in, closer to DC and it was before the Nationals came. So he would come up for a lot of games for them. We would go to some of their minor league teams, and we we're watching the Capitals fans. So it's like whenever we go to a Frederick Keys or Bowie Bay Sox game, we'd be talking about the Capitals. We go to a Capitals game, we're talking about man, can't wait to go to a Bowie Bay Sox game again. So I mean, it's weird, <laughs> but I don't know. It's, but we enjoy going. I mean, we would enjoy. Any of those, if we, you know, if we didn't enjoy any of those, we wouldn't be going to them, obviously. But, I don't know, it's, it's kind of fun to see what's going on. And, and of course, going to the minor leagues, to these teams, it's, you want to see the stars of your favorite pro te- your major league team. So, it's always a good time as well. But Yeah, so, all I'm 
I'm saying is, uh, what, what, what's the phrase? Release the hounds? <laughs> That's right, <laughs> Smithers, release the hounds. <laughs> release the hounds, open the doors, free the slaves, get the, get, you know, mm-hmm. let the kids be kids. Right. And it's funny you mention that because we I recorded an episode of my wrestling show with my, my host on there and we actually made a joke about Vince McMahon being like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. We kept we both kept saying release the hounds and that's weird that you mentioned that though, that's funny. <laughs> but, yeah. mm. but um Yeah, so I mean yeah, we have those games going on and um as I mentioned at the end of our last program, folks, we we're talking about we this episode we started off with a new Musical format, Eric made a good suggestion. I might be trying a few different things. He and I will be bouncing up, but we'll probably start first few weeks with uh, Rocky, Ten, Rocky Ten, as the song is called. And I don't know, be looking for some other things too, probably throwing in some new footage. Seems like we've had a weird combination of footage, like at the beginning and ending of our show, Eric. I mean, it's like we started off where we had the NC Dinos, Cheerleaders, and Baby Shark. Then we had the Mexican. Tommy Narrow cheerleaders and that psycho gorilla, you know. So I don't know. King Kong and Fay Ray, I mean, I think started that with beautiful women and gorillas, I guess. I don't know. So now we have more with CPBL cheerleaders, a girl leading a leading a band singing the song with some monkeys. So instead of gorillas and cheerleaders, we have monkeys and cheerleaders. So I don't know, it's be kind to your animals, folks, and your cheerleaders. I, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> yeah, this comes from years of me watching all the Asian games, so between innings, you get a lot of uh, cheerleader uh, and song camps and all kinds of different stuff. So that's where the musical interludes come in. Yeah. Hopefully you'll see a lot more of that as Things get back to normal in Asia, and we have new materials. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Then you can go back to Taiwan, and then the cheerleaders will come back to your section, and you have your rolls of ones wet ready. And there you got. No, I'm just kidding, but. <laughs> and she dumplings. And she. Oh, oh, hello. Okay, from her, or from you, but. <laughs> mm. uh, oh man! Oh, all right, good for you, man. Shit. Yeah, I knew I liked it for some reason, Eric. There you go. <laughs> cool. All right. <laughs> mm. So. Yeah, I'll show you. When it comes to those again, definitely into the food. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, actually, Eric, that's why I think I wanted to talk about just different. Since there is a kind of a slow news week in baseball this week, I'm talk about like other things we like about the games as far as. I was going to talk about like music at ball games, you know, but um, and we may do that later. But um, you brought up a good thing as far as food. We talk about that a lot on several episodes. Um, I don't know. We'll start with that. What's your favorite ballpark food? I guess anywhere, any team, any league. I mean, you travel almost, if not completely around the world, pretty close. Um, definitely more than a lot of people I know. So I mean, as far as what's your go-to as far as ballpark food? Anything weird, or or me being the um, don't we say this without being too racist? Jew in name only. <laughs> so, so on Friday night, you know, I will do the typical non-Jew thing of having sausage and peppers or bacon on a stick at my typical Yankee game, or you know, anywhere else I'm at. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, I was gonna, I was thinking anything kosher, I, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty boring as far as that goes. I mean, I'm typical, I guess, hot dogs, uh, you know, get that, and I'm specific about hot dogs, too. I mean, there are some, some of my favorites as far as, certain ballparks have, I mean, quality varies, as I'm sure you know, I mean. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I will say your team has the best ones that I've ever had at a ballpark. The, you know, it was when they had 
When we went to the old Yankee Stadium, had Nate's and his dogs there. Oh my god, they were delicious. Probably a close second would be maybe the the um the half smokes at Nationals Park. Um, the the Ben Stilly Bowl, we had a concession stand, sold their dogs. They, are, they were pretty tasty as well. Um, and the only other thing is, like, Camden Yards, and I'm not just saying this as an Orioles fan, but I'm saying this as far as for food, I loved their crab cakes. They're probably, I mean, they have a lot of good restaurants here for them. The ballpark, I was pleasantly surprised at, at the quality of their crab cakes, because usually, I mean, ballpark food is... Pretty much, it's overpriced cafeteria food, but they're, they did they, those really well, especially the first few years of Camden Yards' existence. But you know, hey, Fred Dixon Barbecue, or where it's at in Baltimore. I mean, and he, and even uh, I think there's one uh, Korean concession stand where they have like uh, different types of. Uh, That's barely recent, though. Yeah, because for a while they didn't yeah. have that, but yeah, it's, yeah. I actually don't think I've eaten from that. I'll have to try that next time I go there. But um, it's actually good. I've I've done it several times. Mm -hmm. So when I get sick of the crab cakes, I'll go for the uh, Korean barbecue. Oh, there you go. Okay. So, the, yeah, but Brooks yeah. is always the uh, standard go-to mm -hmm. whenever you get to Baltimore. Right. There were a couple for a couple seasons. They actually had a restaurant scene that was actually going through a revival that used to be very popular here in the 70s. Um, well, I, you know, I think they were pop, more popular in the late 50s and early 60s, but I I kind of grew up on them as a kid in the 70s. Geno's actually had a stand set up in Camden Yards, kind of like in that center field bar area, kind of like on the out, outer concourse of that. And they had a Geno Giant, which was basically their equivalent of a Big Mac, but I mean, it was... Except it was made with real beef instead of, you know, instead of whatever McDonald's uses. And they, they were pretty tasty as well. Um, so. Hey, horse meat is good too, occasionally. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, that's okay. I'd rather bet on horses personally, but that's just me. <laughs> <way on. laughs> All right. Well, let's see. As far as, let's see. Um, one thing, I mean, you and I have talked about with a lot of games, giveaways. I mean, I had a lot. My father took me a lot of Oreo games as a kid, and those games in the minor leagues had a lot of cool giveaways. I don't know. What, what was probably the favorite promotional item you ever got? Well, let's see. Other than bobbleheads? Uh, you can include uh, bobbleheads. I mean, well, that might be a separate category for you, but, you know. It's... Uh, I don't know. Some of the T-shirts are semi-cool, depending on if there's some sort of a theme involved. Uh, any of, like, the replica championship stuff of your team just happened to have been involved in the, uh, World Series title or something in the playoffs the previous year. They'll give up replica rings or replica, uh, trophies of some sort. Hmm. You know, anything that can be made to look like something, but actually still have the appearance of something cool. Right. Something out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, I've got, I've got a few interesting things. Um, one, one thing the Orioles used to do is, like, there was one year where they had it close to the end of the season. They called it a grab bag day, where basically they had leftover promotional stuff from previous games, and they let you pick out some stuff. And folks took me and my sister to one of those, and I always wanted to... It was, like, the second year that they had, like, the white panel batting helmet in the 70s. And I, I got one of those, and my sister, I think, got, like, a... It was, like, a promotional raincoat with a Crown's gasoline logo on it or something. But that was kind of cool. Um, one game I went to, my Little League coach took me and the rest of our team to a game because they had a thing that was called Cap and Coke Day, which basically was the... You got, like, a, an adjustable Oreo cap, and they gave you, like, a one-liter bottle of Coke. And the reason he took us to the game is because our Little League team happened to be the Orioles. And we had, you know, we had four teams in our league. and we, But we had, basically, everybody had the same uniform, except we had different logo patches or stuff. And he wanted us to have different, he wanted us to have actual Oreo hats for our team. So 
he took us there so we can get those. So I thought that was pretty nice. Uh, definitely nice of him. Um, the other... Even better, it was too cheap to actually buy you guys stuff. Yeah. <laughs> for free. Well, he bought us tickets and he took us the game. So, I mean, you can't knock him for that. So, I mean, and plus, I mean, we were, plus we were kids. We didn't know how much stuff was. And, right. All right. And as far as other teams have gone, went to, um, two things actually, oddly enough, from the Phillies that I actually liked. Um, I went to one game where they actually gave, back then it was a choice of either VHS or DVD of a Phillies, it was, like the it was when I went it was two thousand three and it was the tenth anniversary of their nineteen ninety three season when they went to the World Series against the Toronto Blue Jays and it it, it was a, it was actually good at DVD I still have it and it has like copies of like their you know, had like interviews of all their players like Kurt Schilling and Daryl Dalton and a bunch of guys from then and, and you know they had highlights and you know and it's just you know that, that was a pretty cool giveaway and. When I went to that game, I brought my friend that I go to the Bowie Bay Sox game with. He drove up from D.C., he stopped at my place, and then we went up to Philadelphia. I found out later, that same game, he bought for me as a Christmas present, they had a baseball of the 1980 World Series. It was like, they had the logos of the Phillies with the bubble P, and I think they played the Kansas City Royals and beat them. And it was, you know, it was that baseball. He gave me that, and he collected... He was he was with baseball cards like you are with bobbleheads. I mean, he had a ridiculous amount of cards. He actually found an old Mike Smith card from his collection. He put it in a little frame and on um, a wooden stand and like a, another little stand for the baseball itself. And he gave that to me. That was really cool. So um. yeah, yeah, I guess one phase into the other. Uh, I used to do cards many years ago until there were too many sets to uh, try and get everything out of the like, finally, like, I gave up. Right. I think he stopped, I don't, I don't know if he still collects them now, he might have, he might do it, but just not as much, but his wife was, like, even telling him to get rid of some stuff after a while, but before then, I mean, it was like, I remember one time we actually went to Ocean City, and Ocean City, Maryland, and we went to a Delmarva Shorebirds game, and then like, the next day, we actually went to a baseball card store down there, and he wound up buying a set of upper deck cards. And to give you how, an idea how old these were, Eric, it had a warning label, do not eat the gum inside the packs. It actually had a sticker on the box. I was like, jeez, what is <laughs> But... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to love the old bubblegum packs, and you just... You wouldn't even try to chew the gum. You just look at it and stare at it. And every once in a while, you want to like throw it against the wall just to see how many pieces it can break up into. Right. So. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it was like you didn't even want to chew it because I mean, it's like you put it in your mouth. You felt like you're eating like part of like a I don't know model kit with powdered sugar on it. It's disgusting. I don't know. So. <laughs> Uh, the good old days of bubblegum with cards. Oh, yeah. Hmm. And one thing I was never, I'm guessing this might have been older folks that did this, I was never a person that put the baseball cards in the spokes of your bike, you know, to make that sound. I I, I thought that was kind of dumb, you know. It's like, I don't know. Because I, I, I collected cards for a bit and I collect comics and it's kind of like now looking back, it's like I want to take all those people who like used to, do stuff to them except for keeping them in collections and keeping them pristine condition and like slap, go back in time and slap them all. And I'd go back in time to myself when I was in kindergarten and do the same damn thing. But, you know. <laughs> I used to read about people doing that and I'm like, can cards really make that cool of a sound? <laughs> to be a bike book? I, I never understood the concept, but hey. It was... Them. It was kind of a weird sound. It kind of it sounded almost like a, almost like if you took like a an electric fan and you had like a piece of plastic on the blade or something and it made a, and it, it was kind of weird. It's like okay, or and it's like if you paddle fast, it sounds like uh, you're trying to make it sound like a motorcycle. I don't know what the heck they were 
they were thinking with that. But I mean, for me, if I want to shoot for real, I take a take a plastic comb and like put it near the spokes of a fan as it's going. Mm-hmm. Same. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, this is pre-internet, so, I mean, we had to find something to do, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. Well, one thing, I mean, we're talking about music as far as what we played. I mean, every team, like, has, like, either their, I mean, especially older teams, you know, they have either, like, their own theme song or, like, a song that they associate with, like, seventh inning stretches, it, all that. Um, I don't know. I heard some weird ones as far as, like, teams are in this area. I know you have, too. Um, I remember you mentioned one on our episode, and I remember that fondly. Uh, the Frederick Keys had that stupid seventh-inning stretch song where they tried to make it sound like something, I don't know, um, some something you'd hear, like, down at the beach of, at, um, you know, and on the Key West or something, you know, where we're the Florida Keys, and then they want people to shake their car keys, you know, to the beat of the song. It's like, okay, that's that was that's kind of quirky, kind of lame. But then I don't know. Since there will be no more Frederick Keys, well, actually, that's not true. I found out. I think Frederick Keys are going to be in that Major League Draft League, MLB Draft League, and some of their opponents I saw on their schedule. They're actually, I think. Some of the New York Penn League cities are actually joining in with that on that. So it's kind of weird what, what they're doing. But anyway, back to the yeah. music, though. I mean, I remember they had some weird stuff for some of things, right? So like for my team, they had that stupid John Denver. Thank God I'm a country boy. I never understood why that took off, but it did. Um, and I think now the Yankees, I, I only know this from watching on TV. You would be able to know this. Do they still do Cotton Eye Joe for the seventh inning? Or? No, they haven't. We haven't done that in years. Um, seventh inning after Take Me Out for the ball game is really nothing. Mm. You know, nothing uh, constant anyway. Right. And the last couple of years, in the eighth inning, They've done a shit called eighties on eighties in the eighth, where they'll pick out like a random eighties song and have the roaming camera guys go section to section and have people dance to the roaming eighties thing. Okay. Um, which I always thought was a little nuts, but hey, everybody, you gotta have a gimmick somehow. Whatever works. Right, um, right. You know, down in Texas for the Astros, you get deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what was it? Uh, for the Rockies, I guess you probably have John Denver, Rocky Mount High or something. You right. know, crazy. Dumb old thing like that. Yeah. Uh, and then the Red Sox, they do Sweet Caroline. Red Sox do Sweet Caroline. The Mets do... Um, Italian song, uh, Lazy Mary. Oh, okay. Things I have to, um, I don't know, I could probably ramble off a whole bunch of things. That's what I liked about Asia, though, um, where you had your song constantly. There wasn't like a silence as the tip was being thrown, you know. Right. Everything was thrown on all in one. Yeah, it seemed like that watching those games, you know. Uh, KBO and then uh, some of the highlights of the games you pointed me to for CPBL. And I remember watching the movie on, and Mr. Baseball, you know, with the Japanese baseball. And they kind of like had their own cheering. And it wasn't so much like KBO where each player had their own song, where it was more like the fans kind of like in the outfield bleachers were doing this constant song throughout, almost like the soccer hooligans just constantly, you know, just singing throughout the whole game, you know. But. Right. Well, at least they gave it a shot. I mean, yeah. nowadays, nowadays, every player has their own chant song where they go throughout their entire bed. Every once in a while, they'll, they'll go off it when it seems too repetitive. 
the mill on it, did like a rally, a rally song with the point. Mm. But that's what, that's what the Asian baseball is all about as far as I'm concerned. Right. That's why I love you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm sure once in the cheerleaders kind of like getting the crowd to move with that song isn't, isn't a bad thing either, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And get the Orioles to do some, get some girls to dance a baby shark. I might bring some people in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think baby shark has run its course. Yeah. That's oh. What the new yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll see. I don't know. I have to see what the NC Dinos come up with this year. Maybe they'll come up with something else. But I know that was a big that was a big thing in Washington for a while too. I forget the name of the player. I don't think he's even with them anymore. But it was like yeah, around Par. Around Par. Yeah, Par. That's yeah. Because it was like when I went to the World Series viewing party, and it's like you know I didn't really watch the Nationals that much. I went with a Nationals fan, and it's like you know she told me the story about him, and it's like oh, okay. Because, I mean, you saw, I mean, it really caught on. Not just playing the music and then doing the shark hands when he went up to bat or whatever, but it was like, I saw, like, this old lady in our section wearing kind of like a homemade shark hat over her head and people wearing, like, Jaws t-shirts and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So, I mean, I mean, they got, they kind of got into it. He caught on with those bands down there, but. Sometimes that's all it takes is, like, cult following. Right. Now, um, let me ask you this, Eric. I mean, did, you've seen a lot of teams, and you probably follow a lot of teams. Now, some teams, I don't, every once in a while, I don't think every team has this, has, like, their own famous super fan or whatever. I mean, you have, like, I know you have, for a while, you have, like, a San Diego chicken, or you have that crazy guy in Oakland who bangs a drum or whatever. I know, it's like, here in Baltimore, we used to have a, he was a cab driver named Wild Bill Hagee, and he actually wore, like, a, he had his own cowboy hat with a Oriole logo on it, and he would actually go up to the old Section 34 Memorial Stadium, and he would start a, he would spell out the word or, or, Orioles like a cheerleader, and I mean that was like a big thing with him or whatever. Um, and on a he, a, and phew, you want to talk about somebody who can pound some beer, man? I mean, the reason he stopped going to Oriole games is because they used to allow you to bring coolers of beer into the stadium, and as soon as they Stop that. He stopped going for a while. And it probably saved his life, you know, for a little while. He, I think he did leave us eventually, like, about 10 years ago. But anyway, his name was Wild Bill Hagee. Um, do you know, do you remember the Yankees or the Mets having anybody crazy like that who was actually famous for being crazy? I mean, I mean, like, a, as far as, like, a fanatical fan like that, that actual TV stations be interviewing him and stuff like that. Nope, I can't say that I do for the New York teams anyway, but I can tell you this one guy who actually lives in Michigan, but he's an ESL teacher uh, when he when he comes back and forth to Taiwan. This guy was one of the biggest monkey fans around. <laughs> and he would go... Mostly to their home games, but some of their road games also. Uh, and uh, do his little stick. You could actually hear him during the broadcast. Oh, that's hilarious. And what would he do? He'd be taunting the other team? or no, uh, Some taunting the other team. Or, or just like, you know, teasing the fans a little bit. Where you'd be like, uh, strike out, strike out, strike out. <laughs> you'd hear the fans like going against them, but they all love them just the same. Right. Guys, we don't call we don't call them RJ. <laughs> mm. I remember. I'm cool, um, sorry. He's a cool dude. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, I remember. I forget the gentleman's name, but I remember there was a guy here in I'm mean, not too far from here in Washington. He used to do that with the. Wizards and back in the day Bullets where he would get a courtside seat and he would heckle the other team mercilessly. I forget his name. I heard he was like a lawyer, but I mean he wound up getting complaints and banned, I think, from the bleachers he was so I mean and I don't think he would say anything vulgar. He would just be obnoxious and just constantly you know 
being in their face. I remember seeing them, a game where they played the 76ers, and I think Charles Barkley, after they beat the Wizards, he got in his face and were like saying, ah, we told you, you know, they were like razzing him a little bit. It's kind of funny, but... Mm. I might actually, I might actually know who you're talking about. Right. Yeah, you might have seen him, like, I mean, he was doing this, like, back in the day, like, you know, the 80s, early 90s, that kind of thing, and, I don't know. What? Trying to think, the only super fanatical person I would think for any of your teams in your area that I know of, I mean, there, I'm probably some of our listeners know more, would be, um, the Jets, don't they have that guy named Fireman Joe, does he still go to those games, or? Fireman Ed, yeah. Fireman Ed, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, he, he leads the J E T S Jets 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 even when even when they suck suck suck. Right. Hmm. He, yeah, it's getting to the point where he's almost like the the guy hitting the Indian drum for the Indians in a major league movie, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Which, hmm. You know, it, it, especially in COVID, where stadiums aren't full, I wonder how a guy like that actually handled. Uh, either not being allowed in stadiums and or, you know, not knowing where he usually goes. Well, I mean, he only missed one win, at, you know, for them. So, I mean, it's probably, it could be worse for him, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, hmm. Yeah. I'm sure the, sure the beer vendors probably missed him, you know. I wouldn't doubt that, but. I'm sure he was one of their major uh, supporters. Oh, big time, big time. Hmm. So, folks, I, uh, I'm curious to hear, read what some of your comments are, uh, like some of your favorite favorite things at the ballpark as far as food, as far as beverage, as far as giveaways, as far as other fans of these games. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. It's been one thing, one thing with these minor league games, too, Eric. I mean, it's like we were talking about that with the ABL, how they have those crazy games in between innings trying to get people involved and to stop and I don't know. I got like one little story from a Bay Sox game that was actually kind of funny. It was like, so we went to like a me and my buddy. We had the day off. It was it was kind of like a Wednesday getaway game. You know how like some teams they'll have that game like at noon or whatever, so they can get on the bus and go to like to their next you know road stop or whatever. Yeah, we went to one of those and the stadium. I mean, normally holds about like I think like. Maybe seven or eight thousand, and I don't even think it was like one or two there. Okay, so we were just hanging out. It, it was nice weather. It was a good ball game and all. And it's like the one the guy who organizes those games in between innings. He was like desperate, looking for people. And he's like, "Hey, he's like, hey man, you want to do our trivia contest?" And I was like, oh, "Yeah, sure." And then he took me. You know, he's like, "Okay." I'll come back here, like, in, you know, the middle of the fourth inning, and, you know, we'll go onto the field. I was like, okay, cool. So we go out, and I'm walking with him, and he's like, all right, here's the deal. It's like, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you get the question right, you get a prize. If you get it wrong, you get a prize anyway. You know, we're just, you know, we're basically promoting our sponsor here, you know, that kind of thing. So it's like, all right, cool. All right. So, so it was a trivia question about... Where where the Bay Sox played in their what stadium they played in their first season because their stadium was being built and they had to play a few places and I guess wrong I guess like their second place they actually played and wound up being I mean where I thought it was their first place and actually wound up being their second place oh uh, well that's too bad well he gave it a try anyway let's give him a plus anyhow so so the long story short I got like a Miller Lite T-shirt and like I think some ticket to Taco Bell or some food sponsor or something like that. So, I mean, you know, something's better than nothing. So, <laughs> But uh, I thought that was interesting because it was kind of like, I figured they did something like that, but, you know, I, was, I, I always felt bad for the people who got the stuff wrong. It's kind of like, boo, 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 you know. <laughs> but luckily they're not like the price is right and that cruel, you know. They'll still give their stuff because I guess, guess they want to get rid of it anyhow, you know. It's like, I'm, how many Miller like t-shirts could you keep or wear, you know. So. <laughs> but, right. Mm. They'd rather give it out than have it stuck at the inventory pile at the end of the year. So. Right. 
And one time I had press creds for the Frederick Keys and I tweeted about, I was giving updates of the game for our station and I was like, and I mentioned one thing I thought was hilarious. They had a, a brewer, brewery down there called Flying Dog. I don't know, they may, I don't know if they sell it up in New York or not. They are kind of like a microbrew. They sell a lot of places, but, um, they, but they were based in Frederick and they had, their mascot, Coyote, coming around with like a giant slingshot. He was slingshotting hot dogs into the stands. It was like, and people were like jumping up and down, you know, one. It was like, come on, pay three bucks instead of getting one flying at 80 miles an hour, you know? Come on. <laughs> but it was funny. I, I thought it was hilarious. It was like Flying Dog was sponsoring Flying Dogs in the middle of the fifth inning. And I don't know, somebody from the Keys kind of like, Kind of yelled at me about doing that the next day, but I was like, I don't know. I thought that was kind of funny, though. It's, you know, I don't think it was disrespecting the team or sponsors or anything like that. It's like, I don't know, flying dogs, sending dogs flying. You know, so I thought it was cool. But. <laughs> A lot of teams do that, just, uh, you know, like, you know, they have the team that they want to Like you said, I think they are going to curtail a lot of things. I know last year it was like they weren't, wouldn't even allow media into the lockers or anything like that. So I'm guessing they may do something with the autographs and stuff like that. They probably won't have them for a while. Um, right. Or they might figure something out where it's like, I don't know, maybe they'll have like... I know with like a lot of other entertainers, they have like... It used to be like with these comic book conventions, they're doing them virtually where they'll have a celebrity do these virtual autograph signings where it's like, I don't know, you, so, I don't know, they'll have like a picture of like, they'll have like a video, say, I don't know if it's like, say it's like Star Trek, they have like William Shatner. He'll be like in front of the camera, he'll be like, okay, well, let's see, this next autograph's for Eric. How you doing, Eric? Um, You know, I'm signing a picture for you. I appreciate, appreciate you, you know, wanting the request. Appreciate you saying I'm a big fan. I'll send it out to you. So it, it, it might be what I could see a lot of sports teams doing. Maybe do like once a month or something. I don't know how that's going to work. but And maybe even do it first for like children's hospitals or something. Yes, but. Who knows? I'm just looking forward to getting back into the stadium or two. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. Well, and speaking of memorabilia and such, um, I don't know. I thought it was cool last week that you were able to talk to Manny. Ramirez for a little bit and once again shout out to him I understand that he saw the jersey that the Sydney Blue Sox suckered me out of 120 Australian whatever that translate to in American dollars but you got him to sign up for me so thank you and thank him for doing that I really do appreciate that though yeah he's just cool buddy. as a matter of fact I don't even know if he knew that merch was being sold, so mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe sometime this week, it's, it's, it's a week between games. I saw him uh, again this past Saturday, and the next game is until uh, next Saturday. I wonder if this whole week was being spent a little bit with trying to get a hold of his promoters down in Asia saying, hey, you sold stuff for mine? Right. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, it's funny. Yeah, where's your jacket? Well, it's funny because last week I mentioned to you there, I saw a promotional video of him wearing a Sydney jersey at that press conference on top of that skyscraper. Now, one thing I looked for that video again because it was done in December, I think, just before the season started. What was interesting is the jersey he was wearing had a different number. For some reason, the jersey he wore in that video was number 17. And the jersey that they sold online that I bought and that, you, that Manny signed for me was number 24. Now, I'm wondering if 
he was wearing another player's jersey. Just he borrowed one, you know, so he could wear it for the press conference, or and they didn't have one ready for him. I don't understand why he went from seventeen to twenty-four. That was I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, my my feeling is. I don't even know why he went back to 24, where his last year with the Dodgers, he was 99. So, I kind of figured, had he actually played, he would have worn 99. But maybe uh, there's a shtick in Australia where you can't wear 99 for one reason or another. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe their numbering system's different where it's more regulated, kind of almost like with... I guess it's like with football where it's like certain positions can only wear certain numbers. I don't know, maybe it's different in Australia. And I don't and plus the ABL, I mean, this version of the ABL isn't that old, so I don't think they had like any retired players for the Blue Sox who retired ninety nine or anything like that. That's kinda weird. No, not at all. Yeah. So mm. Yeah, I mean I remember you joking in one episode and Half joking, but it's probably a legit concern with the Yankees. It's like they're not going to have too many numbers left. They keep retiring. They have a lot of players' numbers that they retired, but it's kind of like mm, they're not going to have too many left. <laughs> but or or you could do like the Asian players do during spring training, where they wear uh, triple digits. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That'll be in the next generation, you know. Mm -hmm. Number 127? Yeah. That would be kind of funny, but hey. That would be. Three digits, four digits, that would be, yeah, that would be hysterical, actually. <laughs> but, hmm. but maybe not, you might not see, maybe, I wouldn't see it going past three digits because a lot of, I mean, teams in this country are just starting to do that, but, I mean, teams in the other countries, as you know, have, had to make room for the sponsor logos on it, so you know it's right. Yeah, all about the guests. Yep, all about the about the Benjamins. Yeah, which was interesting about my jersey. It was kind of like they had some, but on my jersey, compared to some other ones that I've seen for some of these other teams, I thought it was kind of subtle with their sponsors. They, I mean, they had some where it was it was noticeable, but it wasn't like I don't know some like the. Colombian team jerseys where you had like logos covering just about every part of their uniform where I mean you had I mean I remember seeing some teams they had them had the logos on their backs on their fronts on their arms on their legs on their socks I mean it, you know it was, it was it's a wonder they didn't have them do like tramp stamps too I mean it was it was ridiculous with some of that stuff I mean I guess you get your money where you can but still <laughs> mm. Right, that's, that's what they do with all the I know that. Right. I mean, it was getting to the point. I mean, some of them, they kind of looked almost like NASCAR with all their logos. It was, I never saw so many on a uniform. I didn't think, didn't think uniforms could have that many on there, Eric. But, it, hey, pay enough money, you can make it happen, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't put can on it. With what? You put what you can on there. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Mm. Yeah, that's something, and that's something that you and I try to do. Um, all right, Eric. Well, listen. Um, you have any other memories or anything else you want to add from your multiple visits to baseball parks around the world? Or uh, not really. Um, looking forward to seeing what Asian games are online at Marfrak. I think I the other day, or even a couple of hours ago, that on Saturday, the Warpage Giants have a inner squad game that'll be on YouTube. Hmm. So that'll be something. That'll be something to watch video on the man. There you uh, go. Three famous for the uh, putting their inner squad games online. Hmm. Okay. Uh, sure, the recent games from Taiwan uh, on either CPBL TV or any YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah. It's always something for me to watch it, like I said. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It sounds like it. First preseason game for me starts on Sunday. I'll be 
making the drive over to Hammond Stadium in Fort Myers for the Twins against the Red Sox. So oh, nice. Huh? Hmm. That'd probably be a good game to watch in regular season, but okay, that's cool. All right. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Which will actually play, how many innings. All right, well, okay, well, when we come back next week, folks, uh, we'll be getting a report from Eric from spring training, literally from spring training. I mean, he's been our spring training correspondent for a few months now, but now we're going to actually put him to work, so, you know, so... So, Eric, Eric, I'm going to let you go. Um, Folks, thank you for joining us. Eric, have fun at the Twins and the Red Sox. We'll be looking forward to hearing about that. And, folks, we'll look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. Let's go crazy, run, run,